Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Dinner in Depth. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm here talking with Robert Romanishan, who is an Emeritus Professor of Psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Robert in just a minute, but I wanted to thank everybody for joining us for this new series that is hosted by Deaf Psychology Alliance and also to invite you to come join us at Deaf Psychology Alliance if you are not already a member. It's free to join and you can find it at www.deafpsychologyalliance.com. And this is an extension of our Deaf Insights series, which is a long-running interview series which I have done for the past few years. And so some of these interviews will also be posted on the Deaf Insights website as well. Meanwhile, I'm really pleased to have you with me, Robert. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let me tell you just a little bit about Robert, and then we'll jump right in, because we have a, a really exciting and very unique and unusual topic today. Robert is an affiliate member of the Interregional Society of Union Analysts, and he's the author of seven books, and he's also contributed, of course, to numerous essays to uh, edited volumes and has published a, a bunch of articles on psychology, philosophy, education, and also in poetry journals. He's a sought-after speaker, and he's given lectures and workshops at universities and professional societies in the U.S., Europe, Australia, South Africa, Canada, and New Zealand, and has recently finished a new book called Leaning Toward the Poet, Eavesdropping on the Poetry of Everyday Life. And what we're here to talk about today, in addition to so many of those things, is the fact that Robert is also working on a book called The Frankenstein Prophecies. And uh, so that's going to be an exciting topic of conversation. We're going to dig into that. But meanwhile, I just also wanted to remind people who don't know that Robert has produced also a DVD documentary called Antarctica, Inner Journeys in the Outer World. And that uses photos, music, and voiceover to awaken the heart to the splendid beauty of the natural world, uh, particularly in this time of increasing climate crises, which I know is a topic that is very near and dear to your heart, Robert, as, as well as to mine. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And, of course, Robert, you and I have done a lot of work together, particularly this past year as we worked on the webinar series, Conversations Between a Psychologist and a Poet, which we did together along with Brian Tracy, who is also a working poet. And that was a lot of fun. Yes, yeah, I really thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, so let's dig into this because the topic today, really, we are going to focus pretty significantly on the, the Frankenstein prophecy. So, uh, and, and by the way, you're going to be doing a 10-week course that is sponsored by the Jung platform, and that starts in August. And so we really want to encourage everybody to look into that if you're interested. Uh, there's information on Deaf Psychology Alliance under the events section if you would like to find out more, or you can also go to jungplatform.com. But, Robert, why don't we start out, if you can just talk a little bit about the ways in which Mary Shelley's Frankenstein starts to anticipate the technological world and what that means to all of us to live in a technological world. Yeah, okay. Maybe the best place for me to begin is to say that the whole question of the origins of the modern scientific worldview and the technological mind has been with me for a long time. And the Frankenstein Prophecies is, for me, the next step that follows on the book that I published in 1989 and has gone through about four or five reprints called Technology as Symptom and Dream, where I traced out how um, our ideas of nature, our ideas of embodiment, our ideas uh, of who we are in relation to nature um, were radically transformed in the 16th century, and I trace that to the development of the artistic invention of linear perspective vision. I don't want to go into that in detail, but I do want to say that the codes that I was able to figure out from reading the material around this invention of linear perspective is that the, the idea of the self undergoes a radical transformation and becomes a spectator mind looking at the world through a window. So already what is set up is a sense of our self as apart from and the one who keeps an eye on the world. And in relation to that, the body at the same time becomes a specimen body, the body that we take for granted today as the body of anatomy and physiology. And the world becomes a spectacle for our observation and use. So the conditions are already there, 
And that book is, you know, a fairly scholarly and very much theoretical account of how we are in the world that we live in today. And then I got interested in how do I reach a larger audience because the the world that was birthed in the 16th century, so radically different from the world of the Middle Ages that had a sense of vertical depth, a sense of the sacred, a place for the gods, that the world that we have built and that we're living in now has produced many kinds of crises. And so I got interested in uh, how the ecological crises that we face today, particularly global warming and issues of the God wars, the fundamentalist attacks by one religion or another, um, how they are, in a way, prophetically already encapsulated in Mary Shelley's 1819 novel. So I began to, oh, maybe 15 years ago, to really study Mary Shelley's book. And I found within there how Victor Frankenstein is the embodiment and the personification of what I had called a spectator mind years earlier in the technology book. And in that close reading found seven ways in which her novel actually is a prophecy in, in many ways about the crises that we face today. So that's, that's the way that I would answer the question that you just posed to me. I could go into more detail if you want me to. Yes, I think it would be helpful probably to have just some examples as we sort of dig into it to make it a little bit more concrete. But meanwhile, I mean, you've just, just picked a topic here, Robert, that is very um, – I mean, even just as you're talking about it, I feel personally sort of a a sense of heaviness. You know, it's not a light topic by any means. And I I think that as someone that um, I I personally spend a lot of time with technology, and part of it is just the nature of the beast on some level. We, If we want to communicate with other people in today's day and age, technology is really such a core piece of that. I'm sure they probably thought that when the telephone came along, too, because it was also a huge jump in the technology that allowed us to communicate. But I'm really intrigued by what you were saying about the specimen, the the body as a specimen, and also sort of our way of being in the world, treating it more as spectators. And it, it, it of course, really highlights the whole mind-body split you know, the psyche-spirit split that Jung talked so much about. And, right. um, and, and Anne, I thought it was interesting also that as you were talking, I, it brought attention to what I was feeling in my own body, and I sort of sensed that, that heaviness in, in, my, mm-hmm. in my own self. So I think somehow just by, by creating language around this and, and beginning to, to pay attention to what's happening as we begin to look at the implications of technology and our lack of interaction, uh, on a real connected level with each other that can sometimes occur because of this. Something something starts to shift and change, so I think that's really important as well. Let me respond just for a minute, if I may, to the heaviness, because I think that's really important. Um, the heaviness could also be experienced as as a kind of depression that I think psychologically is endemic uh, in many ways to the world today but also the depression in nature. I mean, when a patient of mine comes into the room or came into the room suffering from a depression, they would also carry the voice of the oceans that are dying, the forest, etc. And that means that there is something in our symptoms, if you look at this from a Jungian archetypal point of view, whether that be anxiety or whether it be a feeling of heaviness or whether it be a feeling of depression or sorrow, that if you treat these as a symptom, then something is is calling us to remember that while technology offers us tremendous advantages, at the same time, we are also leaving behind things that uh, we're being called to remember. For example, how our embodiment in the world ties us to nature, and uh, with a lot of the technology that we're dealing with today, like, you know, with webinars, given its, its fantastic possibilities, We have to use that in such a way that we don't forget who we are. And that's where I see the danger. And then when I put all of that within the context of what are we leaving behind for the future generations, I want to pay attention and not get distracted by all of the the newness, the gadgetry, et cetera, and the way in which the technological mindset 
would keep us busy and amused and entertained because uh, we are stewards of this creation and uh, there is a crisis involved and a crisis means an opportunity as well as a danger. So I think it's an important point that you mentioned. Yeah, I think so. And I, I, this is something that I have thought about as well myself to quite an extreme. I touched on it in my dissertation, which I did via Pacifica Graduate Institute, where you and I actually first met a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember at the time, in fact, I used a quote from Jung that was talking about uh, a caution, really, against our increasing reliance on machines and technology. And he was talking I, probably, I think, in this quote about something that is a very concrete issue that, that can lead literally to the decline and, and potential death of human beings as a species, partly through our environmental issues. But also I think he was talking about the decline and the danger, in fact, to the, the psyche itself through yeah. what I think is an unconscious use of machines. Actually, I'll just read this quote. I, I just found it here, so maybe it would be helpful to have a, something um, specific to talk about. But he says, our intellect has created a new world that dominates nature and populated it with monstrous machines. The latter are so indubitably useful that we cannot see even a possibility of getting rid of them or our subservience to them. Man is bound to follow the adventurous promptings of his scientific and inventive mind and to admire himself for his splendid achievements. At the same time, his genius shows the uncanny tendency to invent things that become more and more dangerous because they represent better and better means for wholesale suicide. Yeah. So I'm sure he was talking probably about the bomb and uh, any number of things that even probably existed during his lifetime. Of course, he died in the early 60s. But uh, I, I also think that this wholesale suicide that he's talking about is, is this whole idea of the fact that we are moving away from a relationship to the sacred, to, to the world itself, to nature itself, that embeddedness in nature that allows us to tap into something that's bigger than ourselves on so many levels. Yeah, well, the quote from Jung is a bit heavy, too, <laughs> yeah. I would say. Um, so, I, I, well, let me, let me go to the, the Frankenstein prophecies in the way that I read Mary Shelley's book. One of the key themes in that book, in fact, the core theme, which then I unpack in seven ways in which it unfolds as a prophecy today, is that the story that Mary Shelley tells, which, by the way, began in a dream for her, so you get the whole thing about how this stuff really comes through the unconscious to this very young woman. And in this dream, which she then writes up as a novel, the core theme is that Victor Frankenstein is retelling the story of creation, first of all, the mythic tale via Prometheus, and then the Christian tale of creation, which has dominated the Western mind, he's retelling both of those tales from the point of view of the new sciences of biology, chemistry, physics, as material sciences. So he's becoming like a new god who would banish death from the world. And in doing so, there is that split, which is at the core of the novel, of the spirit split from matter, spirit and matter split, which is a fundamental theme in the technological world in which we live, where spirit unhinged from matter becomes the fundamentalist mind. And what I'm trying to trace out is how that leads to the God Wars that we see today. Because if we are the new creators and the new God, then the dark side of that God is the dark side of the self, which is Jung's God image, is who is the real God. So that's one of the consequences. And then on the other side, matter unhinged from spirit has become simply material for our use and abuse. And it has led to the ecological crises, to the oceans and their acidification, to the dying of the rainforest, to the melting polar ice caps. It has led to that understanding of matter as inanimate, without soul, without spirit. And within that split, we have a recasting of the old alchemical problem that von Franz said is the spirit matter problem, which she said we still haven't solved. Now, I try to get back to that because there are new hopeful signs that are coming down the road. For example, the new physics, Jung's stuff on synchronicity, 
the phenomenon of crop circles, the indigenous mind, the the work of shamans and energy healing, and what I would call the development of a new kind of sensibility, which maybe we could get into later, which brings us back to a mind as spirit connected with matter and matter that is inspired or inspirited. So there are hopeful signs here, but they can only be realized if we begin to wake up. And uh, I'm hoping that presenting it in story form rather than facts. Facts are important. Uh, What's the carbon footprint? What is the amount of carbon in the atmosphere? We've passed the 350 mark that is supposedly the one where the tipping point occurs. All of those facts are important as well as ideas, theories, concepts, practices. But even the Pope's latest encyclical, he says our lifestyle has to change. Our behavior has to change. We have to live with a different relationship to nature. And I'm trying to get at that by telling a story which opens the imagination and gives you characters that you can relate to. I'm not going apart from the facts, but I want to bring in the imagination to this issue. Yes, well, isn't that just such a critical piece? Because, of course, we know Hillman said that imagination is soul, or soul is imagination, I guess was the way he put it. They're they're one and the same. And and how can we indeed move forward or, or move forward in a conscious way in our culture, or even as individuals who are trying to individuate and trying to also survive life, if you can look at it from that standpoint? You know, how can we do that if we don't have the soul? I think we're facing a huge crisis of soul loss in our in our culture. And so, as you say, the idea of bringing back the imagination and, and infusing our culture, and particularly our young people, with all the possibilities that are out there, rather than, I, th- I think the younger generation in particular is carrying a pretty, uh, speaking of heavy <laughs> burden in that way too, because as they look out on what their future seems like it's going to be at this point in time, it, it must be pretty disturbing. I know it disturbs me. Yeah. Well, that's what led me to write the technology book that was first published in 89. I was seeing young people, college-age students, young 20s, when uh, during the Reagan administration, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists said that we were closer to midnight on again than at any other time in history. We had mm. wired the planet for a nuclear winter. And right. so these young kids were coming in, and no matter what the presenting problem might be, from anything from... My girlfriend doesn't understand me. I'm failing my classes. There was an underlying sense of hopelessness. And so I began to get concerned. How do we, you know, because if you close down the future to anyone, then you close down the possibility of living a life where you can begin to conceive yourself in a way that is possible. And Mm -hmm. that's the best way to stop both uh, the, the idea of the imagination and the openness of the heart. Then you just inculcate fear. So I'm trying to, you know, to reverse that now in a different way um, because facts alone are not enough. They are never enough. They are indispensable, but you need to wrap them within a myth, within a story. And those seven ways that I read the novel provide that. They're like seven little radio dramas, if you want, you know, like these old radio dramas. Um, I, can I give you one example of one of the seven themes, which really... Yes, that would be lovely. Um, so Victor Frankenstein retelling the story of creation becomes the new creator God. And uh, the subtitle of Mary Shelley's novel is All the Modern Prometheus. So already he's a Promethean character. So what does that tell us? And how is he different from Prometheus? And then he retells the story from the Christian point of view, the Christian story of creation. Particularly, he has the creature who never is named The creature that he makes never is named, which is a way of signaling that the creature is marginalized and banished to the unconscious. And the creature is always appealing to his maker, make a mace for me to assuage my loneliness. But what does Victor Frankenstein do? He denies his responsibility. He's a blind god. He's irresponsible. He denies his obligations. But one of the themes, then, is he, like Prometheus, he suffers from titanic hubris, as I call it. And hubris was the great sin of the Greeks where the gods would get you back. 
Well, what happens in 1912 on the eve of the First World War? How is this prophetic? I don't mean a direct link, cause effect. But we build a ship that we say not even God can sink. And okay. what do they name it? The Titanic. Right. And it is brought low to the depths of the ocean by an iceberg where, interestingly enough, Mary Shelley's novel ends or seemingly ends in the frozen Arctic North. So this whole thing suggests to me that Mary Shelley kind of intuited. That's amazing to me. She was an 18-year-old woman. She intuited that there were things that we have been creating that unless we pay attention to them are going to have disastrous consequences. And in a way, we could say we're all on the Titanic now while the band plays on and we happily yeah. go our way, entertained and amused to death. That's worrisome. But we yeah, can very. Yeah. We, we can we can halt that if we can pause long enough and look at the opportunity that we have right now, which I think a lot of people are doing, good scientists, younger people, older people as well. We're beginning to sense that a change is possible, and that to me is hopeful. Yes, and, and that includes, uh, I would add, we've just recently had this whole treatise from the Pope who really came yeah. out in favor of preserving the environment. And th this is really profound, and I, I do also see some hopeful changes like you. But, you know, something you said, Robert, really struck me just a minute ago. You, you said that the creature, meaning Frankenstein, is marginalized. And that, that was just so poignant to me, it's so sad, because, you know, probably a lot of people that are listening to this are like me. I don't think I've read the entire novel since probably mm -hmm. high school when I had to read it for a literature class. And yeah. I, you're really making me wish that I had read it more recently, and I guess now I'm going to have to add it to my growing list of um, things I would really like to read, because I, I think it's so important to go back to that and look at that, because... In our culture, we, we have marginalized so many things, and, and one of them, frankly, is this, um, I think, probably very deep-rooted despair and sadness and fear that we each experience because we have lost contact on some level with that something that's bigger or deeper, with the sacred. And yeah. so what do we do to help ourselves through that? We, we end up numbing ourselves. We turn to distractions. We try to distract ourselves. And technology itself becomes a distraction by which we can not have to pay attention to those anxieties and fears that, that are kind of bubbling there underneath the surface and, and just waiting to arise. So this whole idea of the, the creature being marginalized, as we have marginalized our own feelings and bodily felt sense feelings and emotions and even connections with other people is really, I think, a critical piece of the, the puzzle. Well, I think the connection there for me is depth psychology is the discipline of the margin, conscious, unconscious, dream, being awake, etc. cetera. Uh, but depth psychology has lost some of its purpose, its sense of mission, and it is coming back. I mean, I think the work that you're doing and trying, and not the old clerk and other people as well, trying to bring the soul work and what it means to work soulfully back into the world within this new technology is itself a hopeful sign. So the margins are the place where the action is. And for me, the Frankenstein prophecy is learning how to listen on the margins to the monsters. Now, I put monsters in quote. Because the mm -hmm. creature is not the monster. And yet, look at what film has done. From Boris Karloff forward, it is the creature who is the monster. So it inverts it, a very clever trick of the spectator mind to reverse the polarities there. So now we have to learn ways to go to the margins ourselves and collectively. And those are the environmental crises, the God wars, etc., and to begin to pay attention to what has had no voice, and to be a spokesperson in partnership with what has been silenced. One of the other mm -hmm. themes that I look at is Victor Frankenstein gives no place to the feminine in his new position as a creator god in the work of creation. He creates from the mind of man and man alone. So where is the feminine, and what happens when the spectator mind, the spirit mind as, that has become the new god, creates out of itself? we create the creature who has become the monster. And 
where is the feminine? Where is the feminine today? I mean, despite all of the gains that have been made, where is the feminine in depth psychology, you know? Well, you're there, and a lot of other people now are speaking up. But the origins of depth psychology begin with the hysteric laid on the couch, and I'm making a pun there. Yeah. I'm sure people get it. She was laid on the couch through the interpretations of psychoanalysis. So there was something that was happening there, but it still fell into an old pattern, and that's what's beginning to change. So we yeah. have to learn how to go to the margins, yeah. Yes, I agree with you completely. And this sort of image that you bring up of the feminine being laid out on the couch there, you know, to be mined for her for her emotions mm. on some level, for her challenges and neuroses and hang-ups and, and, and for the unconscious, for what is not on the surface of things. And mm. so, yeah, I think what you said, I, I literally wrote this down word for word just now, Robert, when you said this. You said we need to be a spokesperson in partnership with what has been silent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's that the was, trees, that is, the animals, the ocean, the poor, the Pope sites that one of the faces of the climate crisis, as I would say, uh, are the faces of the homeless, those who do not have justice. All of these are marginal things that we have to begin to pay attention to, yeah. and we are, of course. Um, yeah. But I want to tell it now through this story and give it some sort of container that has an imaginative base to it. Yeah, I think it's so profound, and, and it's such a – you alluded to the discussion work we've been doing with the Alliance particularly around trying to explore and inquire into what is deaf psychology and what has it been and, and what is the future of deaf psychology. And, and for me, what, what you just said about how all these things and beings that have been marginalized, everything from the trees to different kinds of people to the feminine – I, that is, to me, deaf psychology on, on a very deep level. It's looking at the things that have been marginalized. But, you know, really, if you want to talk about making a transition and doing something that could provide hope for us, it's this idea of being a spokesperson because, first of all, you have to listen in order to do that. And second of all, you have to take some action on behalf of, of those things that don't have the voice. So I find that very important in our ongoing conversation uh, about what is death psychology, but also as a real way to sort of bring more of an activist opportunity for people that are generally introverted who may be really profoundly inspired by death psychology, but who haven't really known what kind of action that they could take in order to move this forward. But imagine if we all committed to listening and becoming a spokesperson for those things. I think that's really profound. Well, you've touched on something that is a very important piece and that is transformation begins in the ear, not on the tongue. It's no accident that deaf psychology from the beginning with Freud is called a listening cure. And Mm -hmm. Victor Frankenstein is a deaf man. He doesn't listen to what the creature over and over again appeals to him for. So it Mm -hmm. is, again, and what we have to listen to. We have to begin to listen to the voices of nature as well, to how... uh, Earth is speaking to us in its symptomatic agonies. And so it is about listening, training the ear. And the poet, to me, what is most helpful on the margins is for the deaf psychology to keep company with the poets. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was our Mm -hmm. conversations with the poet. Because the poet, for example, Rilke tells the story of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice from Eurydice's point of view. So when she goes into the underworld and Orpheus goes back like a triumphant hero to rescue her. She's going back up. He turns around as the gods and goddesses knew he would. And Lucas says at that moment when he turns, Hermes put his hand on her arm and it felt like the kiss of an unwanted lover. And he says, Hermes, he's turned. And in the only word italicized in his poem, Orpheus, Hermes, Eurydice, she says, who? So she is liberated from his possession, and Rilke gets it, you see, because he's he's a poet who understands that that voice of the denied feminine, in this case, has to be heard. So that's one example why I think developing a poetic sensibility, I'm not claiming like I did, I did not claim it with uh, the conversation webinar that we did with Brian Tracy, I'm not a poet, but I think we can develop a poetic sensibility as an alternative to the empirical sensibility 
that has underlie or und is the foundation of the technological mind and has led to the crises of the narratives of capitalism and consumerism which justify and sustain the technological mind. So, you know, for me, the poetic sensibility is something that we can all in our daily lives cultivate. There are ways to do that, and that's what I'm going to try and spell out as well. Mm. Yeah, oh, that's just so beautiful, Robert. This whole story, I, I've never heard it told that way about Eurydice when they say he's turned and she says who. That I'm relating completely to what you're talking about, about us allowing the poetic sensibility to come in. That's our own way of liberating ourselves from this, really this reality that seems to be, you know, it's a false reality. It seems to be happening all around us and, and it's so uh, driven by institutions, government institutions and the sciences and not that these things aren't important and have their place, but we've just swung the balance so far over to just buying into so much of the way that things are done in our culture today that we we are not free. We are not liberated and we have to, we are going to have to fight, I think, to liberate ourselves and that's exactly how to do it is by allowing that poetic sensibility to infuse us. Yeah, we all have to, in a way, learn to ask that Eurydice in question. Every time something is offered to us, we have to ask who? Who is offering yeah. that? For okay. example, we are entitled and obligated to our depressions, because our depressions are a way in which we are being called to remember our broken bonds with nature. And yet the technological world, and I don't want to, I'm not only damning the technological world because it has given us many advantages, but we cannot be dazzled by the advantages to the point where we forget what we're leaving behind. And so one of the ways in which it deals with the very thing that is making us depressed is to make a pill that gets us over our depression. We have mm -hmm. to stand up for that. And fight for our depression. I have a right to my depression. I have a right to my anxiety. I have a right to my suffering. And if they want to take that away from me, they're making me less human. So we yeah. have to learn to ask that question. And for that, you've got to go to the margins in yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah, because the soul is in the symptoms. And if we're just trying so hard to stuff the symptoms or pave them over, of course, the lesson is not learned. <laughs> you know, the, the work no. is not done. Yeah. No, the work is not done. And that. You see, I, I think one of the things that if you talk with people just long enough, there's an underlying sadness that a lot of people feel. But we don't have any rituals or ways of talking about the sadness or seeing it as a positive sign that it is a longing for something that we're still connected to and don't want to lose forever. And that's where reading poetry out loud helps because poetry helps you breathe better. Mm. And if you breathe, if you just think about the natural alchemy in the act of breathing, which you can do when you're reading poetry, the natural alchemy in breathing is the moment of inspiration where you take mm. in what the other, what nature offers you, then the pause, and then expiration where in that pause you have transformed what has inspired you and given it back to the other, to the world, where the world becomes word. So again, Wilkes says, Earth, isn't this what you want? An invisible resurrection in us. Are we not here to say house, tree, jug, fountain, perhaps, pillar, tower? But for that saying, the things themselves only hope to be. So it's listening, and it's in that act of breathing and pausing and slowing down and learning to look at the world through images which the poet gives us. And I think in that way, the poetic sensibility gets very close to what the indigenous mind is today, to what is going on in quantum physics with the interconnectedness of all things. So a coalition can be built. I, I feel like I'm getting carried away. There's an old revolution <laughs> from the 60s, so I get too passionate. But I love these challenges, and instead of hopelessness, they fire you up to begin again and always to begin again. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's it's beautiful, Robert. Everything you're saying, not only are the words beautiful and poetic and inviting that that something to come in, but also just your passion is really amazing. And I, th I agree with you completely. We need more opportunities that are based on really solid rituals and ritual uh, a ritual frame of mind that will allow us to start talking about some of these things. And the change is going to have to start with the individual and those individuals coming together in groups and, yeah. and inviting transformation. 
And I, I do think that can happen, and I think I see it happening, uh, particularly in the field of deaf psychology and the community around us. So I, I'm just really grateful for your passion in this, and, and it's just been so beautiful to talk to you about it. I'm excited for the 10-week the course that you're going to be doing with Young Platform. Uh, of course, Deaf Psychology Alliance is a media sponsor for that, and uh, we always support everything that you do, Robert. I just think it's really amazing. That course is called The Frankenstein Prophecies, Union Archetypal Reflections on Ecological Crises and the God Wars. And that starts in August. So you'll want to look under the events section of Deaf Psychology Alliance to find out more information about that or go to youngplatform.com. However, Robert, I just wanted to say we have not finalized details on this, but we have been talking just this week about creating a six-week course that you will offer through the Alliance you, me, and Brian Tracy will team up again to do that, and we're, we're going to be focusing more on this discourse that you've been talking about, about the poetic ability and how that can actually help us as individuals to, to tap into exactly what you're talking about and start to affect that transformation. So our, our working title for that is Cultivating a Poetic Sensibility in a Wired World, a six-week interactive course. So you can watch the Alliance for more information about that. We'll post it as we get that developed in the next few weeks. Um, but meanwhile, is there anything else that you'd like to add, Robert? This is just such a rich conversation. Well, first of all, I want to thank you again, and I want to say that I really admire the effort, the energy, the eloquence that you put into fostering soul work within the wired world. That's indispensable. So thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, you're, you're making an old man feel like, well, there's still possibilities. So, But you're also <laughs> well, keeping me from giving up and sitting in an Irish bar and drinking <laughs> Guinnesses. <laughs> and, Nothing wrong and with I'm, that, <laughs> No, no, there isn't. In fact, what I'm going to do right now is do some of what I talked about, that hopeful side. I'm going to go out and take a walk in nature. So oh, thank you, Bonnie. I really appreciate it. That sounds lovely. Thank you so much, Robert. Again, you can find more about Robert on his website at www.robertromanition.com, and that's spelled R-O-M-A-N-Y-S-H-Y-N, robertromanition.com. And, Robert, I know that people can also buy a copy of your book, Leaning Toward the Poet, which is pretty fresh still off the press. Uh, from your website there. So hopefully everybody can go there and check that out. Uh, again, thank you so much for for our conversation today, Robert, and we look forward to having you back sometime in the near future. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>